My name is Casey, and this is going to be my discussion on inclusive design in gaming tutorials, which I've taken the bold stance of headlining with, hey, listen. Um, to be upfront, I just got in from two full day shifts over in tabletop, and boy, is my voice tired, so please let me know if I should speak up, quiet down, slow down, etc. cetera. Uh, it'll be grateful for all of us, so thank you. But to get things started, a little bit about me. Uh, I once looked like that, adorable, yes. Um, I have been gaming for pretty much the majority of my childhood. This was taken when I was six or seven, playing Mario Kart on the N64. And uh, this is what I looked like last spring when I ran a race dressed as Luigi from Mario Kart. Um, I've been working in academia for nearly a decade as an instructional designer, so helping faculty, helping staff, helping course coordinators come up with the best ways to design their lectures, design their content, ideally presenting it in a way that is engaging and hopefully attention grabbing for students. And personally, I really enjoy introducing my family, friends, colleagues, and similar to new games. Um, half my love of doing games and coming to MacFest is trying to share the experience of you know, what we all like, what we're all passionate about, and similar. Uh, some things I do also want to put out here are that I am not, nor likely will I be, a game designer. I'm appreciator of games, and I respect that there's a lot of work that goes into them, but I am wholly ignorant of the, you know, on-the-ground mechanics of that. So, for any designers or would-be designers in here, you have my utmost respect. Um, I also just kind of want to say up front that what we're going to be talking about tonight, the idea of inclusive design paired with gaming tutorials, it is somewhat complex and there is not a single shining golden answer. What I really want to do is kind of talk about the elements that play into both so you can kind of figure out what the best fit or the best combination of them for a given situation could be. Uh, finally, anything that we talk about tonight is based on a perfect world example, i.e. infinite time, infinite resources, infinite monkeys, infinite uh, availability, etc. So, uh, and the next tutorial for my tutorial is that for this presentation, I'm going to be using the Poll Everywhere application. And I'm going to pause for one moment to make sure that I've signed into that, as I should have. While I do that, if you could please get your phones out, because I will be asking you to take part in a few live polls that will go on during the event. The next slide will be a test case. You'll sign in, you'll give a response, and then we'll take it from there. As I double check my extent, okay, no, it works, huzzah. All right, so uh, if you can please open your device and you'll go to the, you'll open your mobile browser and go to pollev.com forward slash C-A-C-R-O-S-O-N. It may ask you to put in a username, you can just skip that. Uh, my goal with this is just to get kind of your opinions and thoughts on things. This is not to collect any of your information. You will not receive spam email. Uh, notifications and subscriptions will pass you by. Just want to understand the baseline is and give us a better chance to get some, some dialogue going. Okay. Awesome. I'm excited to see that there are some very familiar. So this is wonderful. And very familiar is heading the pack, followed up by somewhat familiar, somewhat familiar, taking head, very familiar, closing up behind. Not at all familiar is lagging, they could approach, but very somewhat familiar is continuing ahead. And I think that's good. Seems like we're settling around there. So uh, good to know that that's about where we stand. Some of you appear to be familiar with this phrase. Others have a more intimate experience. So let's understand what we mean by we say occlusive design, at least for this kind of baseline level for the discussion. So why I wanted to talk about this is that in my professional field, inclusive design is a you know, growing and very important discussion point. It's important for developers, for educators, and similar who create content with the intent of it being experienced by an audience. And I think that can best be surmised by this video of Kat Holmes, who at the time of its recording was the head of inclusive design and accessibility at Microsoft at the time. Uh, this is also the first video, so please let me know if it is too loud or too soft, and I will adjust accordingly. And that's, I'll do, try to do the short. <laughs> Take your time with it. <laughs> um, you know, honestly, um, I'm learning. I'm learning every day. Yeah. Um, the the best um, definition of inclusive design I've come across so far is is designing a diversity of ways for people to participate in an experience. Um, and so, what she described right there. And that, that's, I'll do, try. To beg pardon. Thank you. And that's, I'll do One more time, Kat. Thank you so much. 
Uh, as, she just, as she said, designing a diversity of ways for people to participate in an experience. That is essentially the nutshell of what I'll be talking about when we, whenever we reference inclusive design. The idea of it is to essentially create a process, create a method of delivery so that you target an audience, you do all that you can to make it approachable, accessible, welcoming for them, and then whenever you relaunch that project, you revise it, re you review it, you do the next iteration, you target a new group, and you expand on what you've done become. You want it to always be inviting and to be as broad of access as possible for those you seek, you seek to reach it with. So for the next question, how familiar, you, how familiar are you with game tutorials? Oh, cool. Uh, what are five game tutorials? Shout them out. I'm kidding. Please continue answering on the poll. <laughs> Great. I may be asking you guys that later on, so thank you for that passion. To whoever plays their new games with the sound off and a blindfold on, I salute you. <laughs> Please Twitch stream that. We've had dance pad challenges. We've had piano challenges. I want to see the sensory deprivation challenge. <laughs> All right, so I, I felt pretty good that MacFest attendees would have a, have at least have tried one game tutorial before, so thank you for that. But to again kind of set the baseline of what we mean in that regard, um, again, why I chose this topic, it came to me after I had just done a professional course on inclusive design, and literally that night I was playing Pokémon Tournament on the Switch. And I knew at one point when my Pikachu faced off against my rival's Blastoise, it would go from a 2D fighter to a 3D fighter, and I had absolutely no idea what the heck that meant at the time. So I had the thought, I'll do the tutorial on it. Followed by the next thought, when have I ever said or thought that phrase before? Tutorials really are useful, aren't they? And I think that is best surmised by this excerpt from the Extra Credits channel when they do an even fuller discussion on what goes into a tutorial and how it can benefit you. Play itself. Because every game is an education. Every game brings us to worlds we've never been to and throws us into situations we don't recognize. Every game asks us to translate between some series of button presses or clicks and actions happening on a screen. So every game requires a tutorial. And if you're mindful of this and disciplined in your design, you can create the best tutorial there is. One that no one remembers is there. So the key takeaway in that that I really enjoyed, and pardon me as I fight with Google Slides once more. Play itself. Nope. Play itself. Nope. Because every game is an education. <laughs> oh, you animations. Um, the key takeaway that I have there is the phrase, every game is an education and every game requires a tutorial. It hit me when I was researching this topic that truly every game has the potential to be someone's very first game experience. Pong could be your first game, Elden Ring could be your very first game. And while there's a steep dif uh, difference between those two, every game in some way has to tell you, the player, how you should play that game. And so in this regard, kind of the scope of game tutorials is basically what the game tells you as the player of how to play it. Not without looking outside of it, not without looking up guides on the internet, but what does the in-game tutorial do to teach and explain things to you as you're learning it. So this is essentially the topics that I hope to hit this evening. We've already done the personal and topic introduction. We're going to be next moving into inclusive design, touching on the accessibility purposes, the ideas of universal design, and finally, what the heck does this have to do with gaming anyway, you crazy man? We'll then go into tutorials, talking about the bad, the good, and then ultimately, what we would want from them overall. You may have noticed a theme here with Legend of Zelda. I kind of like that game series and would like to shout out Tingle and Navi in the back. Thank you guys for showing up. <laughs> So inclusive design, um, through painstaking research with Professor Oak, I have devised this evolution chart for the progression of accessibility, universal design, and ultimately inclusive design. Inclusive design ultimately sits atop the shoulders of universal design and accessibility which come before it, which are essential purposes in making games and experiences accessible to the people that they hope to reach with them. I also want to be upfront and now and state that uh, this is all coming from my perspective as a cis hetero white Western American male in his 30s. So I feel like, yeah, uh, I feel like I am the target game audience and I currently have no disabilities. So as much as I'm trying to just share the information that I have, I am still very much learning as part of this process. So I'm very eager to hear and hear from those who have different experiences and viewpoints than mine. And if I say anything wrong or offensive, I apologize upfront. I, that is purely my ignorance. But on that subject, 
Uh, in broad strokes, accessibility in this regard is to devise components to support visibility and hearing issues, af uh, affect those to support learning disabilities or challenges with learning or different methods of doing so, and to provide variety in terms of size, scaling, input commands, or whatever an audience might need. The big thing here, which is at the quote at the bottom, is that accessibility comes largely from the world of architecture and design, dealing with physical structures, objects, and spaces. And the idea of accessibility is that it puts the onus of making those things accessible to a group by the people that control those spaces, rather than having people who have accessibility or disability needs, making them have to make accommodations for themselves. The great thing about accessibility is, while this and a lot of these topics are still developing or still progressing, that ball is still rolling, it is at least becoming more of a baseline and an absolute legal requirement, which is better for all of us, I think. The next phase of this goes into universal design, or as I use it in my day-to-day, -day, UDL for learning. This is kind of the next step of accessibility practices, in that while accessibility might be, let's put ramps and automatic doors onto a building once it's nearing construction, universal design tries to flip that topic and say, okay, how could we make this thing, this object, if you're from Philadelphia, this John, how can we make it accessible as much as we can from the get-go? Uh, this is devised into this sign that comes from the Research Institute down in North Carolina to multiple components, talking about equitability in their use, flexibility in their use, simple, intuitive, low physical effort. Um, the simplest example that I've seen for universal design is the curb cut and a sidewalk. Having the sidewalk dip down to meet the street is great if you are using a wheeled device of any kind, be it a wheelchair, a shopping cart, a baby stroller, or similar. Uh, also, automatic doors are great. One, if you would have a hard time opening the door under your own power. Or, in my case, if I'm trying to bring in 20 loads of groceries in one trip from the car like God intended. So, it benefits all of us. Um, and while this is a fantastic demonstration of universal design practices, it honestly puts me in mind of a moment of my childhood, and again, tying it into Legend of Zelda. Has anyone played OG Smash Brothers MAGFest N64? This image right here, with particularly Link holding the paper fan, best represents my 10-year-old self thinking, why am I holding a sheet of paper when I should have a sword fighting a fox with a laser gun? <laughs> Link's expression here is great because it kind of shows that same bafflement of what the heck am I supposed to do with this, which does a really good job of translating that from the character to the player, as we will soon see. So what do these have to do with games? The elements of accessibility and universal design are becoming more and more tantamount in games because they provide these physical resources in the gaming experience. Uh, the image that I have here, which I apologize, is quite dark. This is of the accessibility options menu in The Last of Us Part Two, which has been lauded as having a fantastic set of options. The ability to remap the controls that you use in the game and customize the game's difficulty setting to make it more of what you want to experience, whether you want a harder combat challenge or just to know the narrative story. This is amazing for anyone of all levels and all experiences to get what you want from it. Furthermore, the simple and intuitive use, using the characters and the design in the game to point out where should the player go, what should they be doing, having callouts to objects of interest and important points of information. Again, very, very helpful, and you can follow them or bypass them if you so choose. And finally, my favorite, having clear perceptive information, which I have not done in this image, I apologize. This is best represented by anyone who's played Breath of the Wild by the DLC item, the One Hit Obliterator, the greatest weapon name that I think has ever been devised. In the game where you get things like the Flaming Spear, the Light Sword, the One Hit Obliterator tells you exactly what it does. The description, it kills anything in one hit, but it kills you in one hit too, is great. And last but not least, when you obtain it and when you hold it, Link, the character, holds it in his dominant weapon hand, letting you, the player, know, I'm probably going to hit someone with this fancy stick. So I've been talking a lot, and for that I appreciate your patience, so I'd like to put it to you all. Through Poll Everywhere on your mobile devices, are there any other options of accessibility or similar in games that you enjoy? 
This is another image from The Last of Us Part Two. You're able to actually add on a color and highlight filter so that the player character, objects of interest, items, objects, and enemies all have their own unique shade to help make them better represented on screen. Color, yes, colorblind modes, especially for games that have a reliance on color, being able to ensure that players will be able to actively see them is amazing. And that can even be as simple as just having the lighter dark mode on on your Discord or on your Google or your Skype call. Subtitles, Southpaw, fantastic ways to customize it and make it something that you want. Voice to text, change the font. You guys are on top of this, thank you. Eye tracking for low mobility, yes. HUD size, these are all excellent ways to make this something that is better and easier for the player to engage with and make their experience more worthwhile and more, I don't know, memorable. Subtitles, subtitles, I can't watch anything now without subtitles on or I feel like I'm losing content. Brightness adjusters, ability to pause, got invincibility mode. If you want to have fun or if you just want to experience it for something without the challenge, that is fantastic. Ooh, yes, alt controls. I, I am a lifelong Nintendo fan and it makes me really kind of, my heart ache when I realize that Nintendo is sadly, I think one of the least accessible in terms of their games and their designs. Shout out to the Microsoft Xbox accessibility controller here. So hopefully we'll be able to get more resources like that in the future. So these are fantastic guys. Thank you so much for these. And I may hold on to and borrow some of these. Hopefully the next time I can do this talk. But so moving ahead, I love that one, that you can have danger potatoes now in games where you might not want to see a spider. That is fantastic. My family would love that. So these are good. I'm going to keep going, but I look forward to hearing more of these ideas. Change the keyboard layout? Yes. So moving on to the meat of this, I'm going to talk now about inclusive design. Uh, inclusive design is basically accessibility, universal design, and inclusive design is what sits on the top of that mountain. That is like the shining goal that hopefully everyone can reach for and achieve when designing something. Basically, it's a design process that considers the full range of human diversity and experience with regards to ability, language, culture, gender, age, and any other way, shape, or form that humans may differentiate themselves between one another. The bottom quote summarizes that inclusive design is meant to focus on the lived experiences of its audience to give them relevance and to ideally elevate the voices of those who are normally uh, excluded or ignored. An important thing is to basically find the people from the corners that you normally don't hear from and give them a platform to stand on and recognize them in that space. So this is the hill that I will now die on. I believe that Ocarina of Time's Navi, shout out to you in the back, is a fantastic Er example of inclusive design in games. Point in fact, whenever Navi says, hey, listen, it provides an audio and visual cue on screen for a prompt that there is something important that the game is trying to tell you, two methods of communication. It gives contextual relevance to characters and spaces on screen. Yellow for enemies, blue for NPC interaction, green for, hey, wouldn't it be cool if a scarecrow burst out of the ground here? And along with the Saria song, it provides a great way for the game developers to nudge the player in the right direction or to remind them of story or plot points. As I said, this is an Ur example, though, so it is not without challenges. Um, hey, listen is great as an audio cue, but it can also be overwhelming, repetitive, annoying, frustrating. Can I crush that fairy in my grass for the love of God? Yeah, thank you. Um, and also in researching this, I learned that uh, the Navi, Navi, originally designed as the navigation system for the game, hence why they got it, is about an eighth, roughly, of what they hoped to do. In order to fully utilize Navi as she was originally intended, it basically would have made building Ocarina of Time a second time over, which you just could not fit on an N64 cartridge. So there are certainly development resources at that time that were a challenge. But so back to you guys. Are there any games or tutorials that you've played that you think have a less than stellar job? Anything that you've done of, this hasn't really taught me anything, or I actively don't want to play this game anymore just after the tutorial. My goal of aiming for low hanging fruit here in case Skyward Sword, it's great to be told what a blue rupee does every time you pick it up after playing the game for 30 hours, every single time, every single time. Claptrap is annoying, Starship Horizons, RDR2, Civilization. 
these are a lot of really chunky games with a lot of deep mechanics that I imagine it is, yeah, just getting like a wall of text. Twitter that just shows a controller with labels, yes. This is just a, by, by a show of hands, I just kind of love to know this. Do you all have a preference for, if you're playing a game, if a character says, hey, adventurer, you should move the joystick on your controller by doing X. Is that annoying or do you care about that? Show of hands, yes or no? It's great that I probably should have identified that beforehand, so thank you guys. All right, if you think it's annoying when a uh, uh, Call of Duty man is told, hey soldier, press the joystick to move forward and click it into advance, raise your hand if you agree that that would be frustrating or break your immersion in the game. Okay, thank you for reminding me to qualify that question. I appreciate it. Minecraft can't be played without the wiki. Yes, anything you can't disable or skip. Yes. Only had Catan explained because your friends and could never read the, these are such great examples. And again, very chunky, very slow. That one, that top one, perfect example coming up and I will show you why. Tutorials, semicolon, the bad. Presenting unwanted or excessive information. Loss of agency or control in the player. Hard to access, having an unintuitive interface, etc. These are some of the examples that I could think of on my own, but as I'm sure some people here would recognize, the Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon tutorial specifically does a great job of showing just how bad they can be. Let's watch, shall we? Climb to get higher. Oh, seriously? Loading more training hints from the ABCs of War. Count it off, this is one pop-up with no context. Two. Three. Four. None of these things have been in the game so far. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. You can't move right now. Nine. Ten. Someone bought this game. Eleven. I fucking hate tutorials. And this one is terrible. Uh, thank you, Far Cry Man. Thank you. <laughs> Russell with slideshow. <laughs> Alright, so as a lot of people said, that being essentially a tutorial can be really challenging when it feels like it's holding you hostage. When you can't move, it's just a wall of incomprehensible text. You can't skip past it and you have to just grind through it with no option, whether it be your first or 50th time playing a game. Far Cry Man, no. Yes. Yes. Um, basically, for. Mm -hmm. Design tutorial is the last, so you have a month left before you ship the game. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a, it sounds like it was likely a last minute edition, and thank you very much first with that experience. A last minute edition made to be comedic and satirical to kind of take a bit of the sting out of that bite. But for, for with all of this incomprehensible text, wall of information, we can see how it might make you a little frustrated like our good friend Link here. <laughs> Thank you, Terminal Montage, for that wonderful bit of comedy. <laughs> not again, not again, not again. All right, so now that we've gotten past that hurdle, what are some games that have, or tutorials in general, that are instructive, engaging, that make you want to connect with them, that get you everything that you can receive from them? What are games that, are that have tutorials that you think are worthwhile experiencing? Again, low-hanging fruit. Question in the back, yes? Oh, my apologies, thank you. The URL is uh, p-o-l-l-e-v.com forward slash C-A-C-R-O-S-O-N. <laughs> Breath of the Wild, oh yeah, eyeballs. Um, 
as far as I know, Breath of the Wild has become kind of the ultimate sandbox tutorial. You walk out of a corridor, and that's how the game tells you how to maneuver out of a corridor. And you're rewarded with a beautiful, breathtaking vista where you know, I could go everywhere there. As you progress through the Great Plateau, there is the hard limit of you can't jump off, but uh, you get some checkpoints, and you learn how to cut down trees and how to resist cold by eating lots of spicy peppers over time. Celeste, two dots, portal, cat quest, I've heard Portal described as basically a full tutorial that was made into a game. <laughs> All right, glad I wasn't the only one there. Shovel Knight, the level design, yes. I've really loved reading, I sadly have not played it, but Ghost of Tsushima, where you can like ask the game to give you a hint and the wind will blow in the direction that you should head at that time. That is like a wonderful immersive way of being like, help please, oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, nature. I will go on now. Portal, Mega Man X. A lot of these are really familiar, and a lot of these are bringing me a lot of joy to see, so thank you guys. Cuphead, I'm not a game journalist. <laughs> Sounds good, thank you. Nancy Drew, which one? I just know the book, so that's it for me. All right, these are great, y'all. Thank you so much. Civilization, uh, I have feelings about that one. And Stray, cats. So I'm going to move ahead now, but these are fantastic. And again, I'm going to look back on these for a little bit more research. So thank you for these suggestions. Uh, like I said before, I am Nintendo boy. And so anything outside that realm is great. Ooh, Salmon Run. Awesome. So moving ahead, this next bit, I just want to talk about some of the components of inclusive design and how they can relate to games and really any kind of content or media that you're developing. One of the biggest ones, and something that is like tantamount to inclusive design, is the idea of providing and soliciting feedback from the audience that you're engaging with this. And how this works in game design, it can be game patches, updates, and rebalancing based on user-submitted feedback. And while I understand that the internet can be a dark, scary, and ultimately toxic place, there are ways to put that for good, which is what I think the team behind Darkest Dungeon did when they were developing some of their early alpha processes. Like everything you're doing is a compromise, like making a game is a lot like that and running a company is a lot like that too. So we, we went back and forth on this corpse thing and ultimately we decided, no, this is the right, correct choice. It works. Did we roll it out properly? No. Did we set expectations properly? No. Should I have drawn corpses for every single monster so that it was like this fun feature? Like, look at all this new art. Yeah, I should have done that, but we didn't think we needed to. And that, th those were our mistakes. But what we did, and I think this was also a really good decision, is we recognized that even leaving five or 10% of our community behind would suck. So we put in an option to turn the corpses off. That remains in the game to this day. Of course, we default that they're on uh, because we default everything to the way that we want you to play it. As much as we do crazy stuff like permadeath where we're never gonna toggle that auto save and be like, you can turn the save off. I mean, there are ways to save scum, go nuts. They're not that hard, but we're always gonna configure it the way we want you to play. If it wasn't as big of a controversy, we probably would not have ended up with that solution. I think that was a really interesting way of dealing with difficulty in our option system. Like we don't have like easy, medium, hard. We have a bunch of features that you can disable if you want and if you're having trouble, which ended up paying out later because we have like a bunch of kind of weird, <laughs> unique options. And then we pulled metrics and like 1% of players were turning them off. And we just tanked the review bomb. So what they were talking about there is they implemented a feature that 5 to 10% of their test base at that time was very vocal about not liking. They ultimately decided to stick with that feature, but as they said, they made it an option that you could toggle on or off while keeping the default what, they, what their intended experience was. So they were able to meet their goals while still providing the players the ability to customize it to a way that met what they wanted based on the feedback and the dialogue that they received. Somewhat ingenious, I think. Video will now play everything because I don't know how Google Slides works. And now we continue. Hey, look, it's the owl again. The second major component is to set and maintain a clear structure. For when I do my work for academia and instructional design, this means have a homogenous layout. Don't move buttons around arbitrarily. And if you're an exposition dumping owl, don't change the order of your yes and no options after narrating a short novel to a young adventurer, causing you to repeat said short novel at addendum until we stop button mashing to continue. Um, I know that some games will pull abilities. If anyone has ever played Metroid, you should be very familiar with losing all your power-ups near the beginning. 
but I think in that way it works because you're seeing a reason for this. It is being communicated to you. You have not suddenly had something that you understood to change arbitrarily behind the scenes three hours in with no mention of it. I may have a lot of feelings about this owl. I apologize. This is a safe space for me. Uh, the next one I want to talk about, and this is very big, is the feature of diversity. Uh, Featuring diversity in the examples or the overall field exhibited. Um, from the high score docuseries that was on Netflix back in 2020, they did an interview with one of the early designers for the Madden game series on Sega Genesis. And he said this quote, which really, really stood out to me. That for marginalized people, a lot of energy is devoted to justifying your existence in spaces. So when you see yourself placed as the default option there, to be upfront, to be normalized, it has such deep meaning. Games are kind of still in a rut. Uh, from what I saw from polling a few job listing sites, the average video game tester, the person kind of providing feedback on the look, the design, the experience, maybe not how the game mechanically functions, but what the player may get from it, could be best described as a 43-year-old 43, 43 white American male. That's a very, very, very narrow bandwidth of who is playing these games nowadays. And thankfully, as the study in 2022 proves, while it is still very white American, cis hetero straight male dominated, the bar is beginning to move, thank goodness. Uh, at the time that this was done, around 2022, Apex Legends was identified as the most diverse game that they studied. Uh, at least half of the player character population at that time was non-male with option with at least a one or more non-binary options, and there was a broader spectrum in terms of uh, orientation and background of player choices. So you could be someone who was not just one of the many thousand dad characters that exists in these games. Like I said, this is something that is just rolling. I really hope and pray that there is more of this and we continue pushing this further and further for more and more inclusion in games as we go along, but just wanted to give it its due space here in this conversation. Back to silly things. Pokemon is a game that we all have played, right? I see you, Team Rocket. Uh, identifying agency between characters' choices. As I spoke before, The Great Plateau is a great example of this because whatever you learn at that time is rewarded. You learn how to chop down a tree to cross a gorge. You now know how to get firewood later on. You have to climb a mountain or brave the ocean. You now know how to do that in the regions that are specifically designed around those things. Everything that the game teaches you how to do, it is rewarded by impacting that. And if you already know how to do it, you can skip past it. I stood up and cheered the first time a Pokemon game asked, hey, do you already know what a Pokemon is? Thank you, Professor Sonia. You have just made, you have just shed 20 unnecessary minutes off of being shown how to catch a Weedle for the 50th time and not having to go through that again. And as I said before, emphasizing the real world applications of the work is tantamount. The very first level in Super Mario Bros. 1-1 has been described as a great design to say, you start the game, a Goomba's gonna walk towards you. If you don't learn how to jump, the Goomba will kill you. You'll then learn how to jump, what Goombas do, and how to continue navigating the level. Mega Man X, apologies, is another fantastic example of this, as Aaron Hansen, aka Eager Raptor, has already shown in his own video. The design of the level, the flow of the enemies, the way the environment shapes and changes to encourage the player to experiment, to learn, to try, is a great way of naturally shaping it to help them ramp up those skills that they get from the get-go. Uh, I saw that Sonic the Hedgehog was mentioned from this, a similar fashion, learning how to jump, learning how to maneuver, learning how to go through challenges and loop-the-loops, everything that you you can do by the end of the game, you have access to at the beginning of the game. It's just learning and developing and honing those skills. So this is everything that we talked together. The main elements of inclusive design, feedback, clear structure, diversity, agency, and emphasizing real world applications. So what I'd really like to know from you guys is which of these do you think is most important? Which of these fits best? So grab your devices, everyone. I sense some of you see another poll coming on. Because I would like to know, let's all put our heads together, metaphorically, because that would hurt otherwise. And if we were designing a game with simple mechanics, a simple platformer, a basic puzzle game, and we were building the tutorial, and we wanted it to be inclusive, which of these elements would you put first? And this will be a ranking poll, 
So what you'll want to do is essentially hit use the up and down arrows on your device to elevate these. The topmost option is what you think is most important. The bottommost option is what you think is least important. And once you start getting results in, this should show us the general average of our responses in the room. Oh, there we go. So, so far the emphasis is on soliciting feedback from the, ideally the audience, the player, and I spoke too soon. It is to maintain a clear structure in the controls and design of the game. Promoting agency and autonomy, featuring diversity, perhaps being able to choose your character or customize it to look more like either you or what you want it to look like would be great in that regard. Okay. Seems like we're settling in. We would feature having good established rules and controls for the game itself, making sure that the choices that the player makes are recognized and autonomous, getting feedback from them, featuring diversity in the examples, and ultimately showing that, hey, if an angry mushroom does walk towards you, landing on its head is the best way to defeat it. But so now I want to ask, would any of that change if the game that we were making changed? This would be the ideal kind of design for a simple game, but we had a lot of chunky examples before, Dota, Civilization, Minecraft. If we were making something like that, would you change the ranking of any of these? Would you put more emphasis on, I don't know, real world applications of this? Would you encourage better diversity because you know a wider audience may be engaging or seeing this? How would you make the perfect RPG tutorial based on these elements? Okay, so so far it looks like we're pretty much hitting along roughly the same notes. Agency and having a clear structure is still in the lead, making sure that essentially what the player does is rewarded and how the player is taught is reinforced and kind of unchanged for no reason beyond that. Diversity in examples, giving its due spot, feedback in real world applications. I guess as is shown here in Stellaris, not that many of us will be realistically running a solar space empire, but we can all dream. All right, thank you so much for this. It's good to know that essentially across the board, no matter how broad or uh, narrow a game may be designing, that this is what a general audience of MAGFest attendees would want to see in the tutorial that they would make and play with it. So thank you. So just to kind of wrap up and in conclusion a little bit, overall, I just want to share that inclusive design, it builds upon the pre-existing goals of accessibility and universal design for learning, ideally, uh, taking them on, elevating them, and using them to heighten its own intentions. The design of tutorial can absolutely be challenging, but when done well and with heart, ideally not, ideally not tacked on the end that we learned might some, way, some ways be the case, but kind of thought about engaged throughout the entire process, that's when it can become the best that it can be. And that each of these inclusive design and tutorials can be beneficial when applied within the right context. When I was researching this, I did read a uh, study paper saying that of a test case of participants polled, they actually got really frustrated at the tutorial. They thought it was overbearing. They thought it was too much. They said that they wouldn't even need it. And then at the very end, they said, oh, but we were basically making a match three game. So we may have overdone it a little bit or we didn't provide too many options in that regard. Ultimately, though, I think tutorials are a key and important part as our good friends at Dwarf Fortress can highlight for us. With the recent full release of the game and its recent actual tutorial, their stated mission goal was, we want the world to be able to lose Dwarf Fortress and still have fun doing it. The designer told a story of how their spouse learned how to build a base, tunnel into a mine, and then completely flood said mine in the first hour and laughed their head off doing so. So, oh, and thank you, Navis. Thank you so much for all of your help this evening. Uh, that is what I have prepared, everyone. So I want to know, do you, you guys have any questions, any thoughts, any ideas about this? This is also my real character in Monster Hunter, by the way. Hats off to the, to the, uh, Gargwa, to the Gargwa squad. Yes, sir. Up front. Green hoodie. Uh, I feel like with uh, the Cape Horror and Aurora example, mm -hmm. I feel like that one's not so much bad design because, like, Ocarina of Time is a really impenetrable game if you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. There are three characters, more or less, who are valuable sources of information mm -hmm. in the game. So you've got Sora Mora, mostly direct, unlike you've got Sheik in the adult timeline, mm -hmm. uh, Navi throughout every other situation. I mm -hmm. feel like you know, you've just looked at your forest, 
there's a lot mm -hmm. you don't know, and you're also kind of that guidance is like that. It is a very intentional choice to flip it to stop from button and that is, the, that is the key thing that I wanted to feature on the comment was that Kapora Gebora, i.e. the Ocarina of Time Owl, is it, they do carry a really heavy load in trying to deliver a lot of exposition in what may have been people's first 3D open world game. So I'd certainly understand and give that character sympathy. I identified that the Owl, Navi, and Sheik are the main ones to say, hey, this is what's happening in the world and what we should be doing right now. And it's mainly just that, and while that is necessary, it is mainly just that someone made that choice of changing the yes and no uh, orientation, I trust that it was because designer knew that player should learn that plot, that it would be important and impactful, and that they didn't want it, they didn't want, they didn't want it to be easily skippable for perhaps the first time player. It just had perhaps unforeseen ramifications that we're still making fun of and groaning over it now. So thank you for that. I saw, uh, from our designer up front, and then from the gentleman in the MAGFest hat behind. I have a question. So Shoot. I'm a game designer, and a lot of my coworkers look like you, who are wise to standard heterosexual. Yep. How do you persuade them the importance of the people? That is a really good question. Thank you for asking that. It was, how do you persuade people who like me perhaps exhibit kind of the majority or the primary audience that these experiences would typically feature? Um, the best example that I can give is what I try to use for my own work, working with faculty and members in academia. And the best thing that I can do in that regard is saying that time devoted, whatever time you can devote to doing this work up front, time that you can invest in it along the way, means that it's less time done in crunch and panicking at the very end. Uh, the, the, as I've learned, the closest thing to a faculty member's heart is reducing the number of angry emails they get from a student at the end of a semester. And so I would say whatever the kind of rough equivalent of that might be, trying to encourage and emphasize that if we can bring this in as we go along, it'll be a better experience for the players. They will talk more positively about it. They will, any forums, any discussion we'll have, it'll be better. And ultimately, that means hopefully more people will buy our game, more people will re uh, review it positively, talk about it. Uh, positively, and it'll be less just crunch that y'all might have to do at the end should things change. So I, I'm sorry to say that's probably the closest answer that I can give, but again, much respect to the work that you do and the peers that you collaborate with. Uh, gentleman in the MAGFest hat, yes? Uh, my one question is it seems like tutorials are often one and done. Mm -hmm. Right at the beginning, put the game down for like a couple minutes, mm -hmm. and then I come back and I have no idea how to play. <laughs> yes, that, that being the inciting thing that sponsored this, and I completely forgot to mention, having the option to access a tutorial like from the start menu or having an in-game help guide or wiki is tantamount. Being able to like being able to just queue up open your quest log, look at your journal. Why the heck am I traveling across this mountain range? I forgot what I'm looking for. I know that there's been some discourse with like Elden Ring having like a very minimal setup versus some games having, you talk to someone, oh, an icon appeared on the far end of the world and I know exactly the name of the unmet NPC, NPC that I should speak to. So there's, there's certainly a range, but yes, being able to revisit, replay, or re things is just as important as being able to skip them if you already have that knowledge. So thank you so much for, for pointing that out and giving that reminder. Thank you. Um, Person in the back, and then we'll go with in the brown. So, so when you were showing the, the Far Cry 3 thing earlier, we had like, all the Royal Ring products. Yes. I did see a lot of, um, I remember seeing it like, just cause 2, where the loading screen will show you like, the controller with mm -hmm. some buttons. And, like, I know I personally, I hate those kind of, that feels like a kind of cheap way to do a tutorial. Mm -hmm. it, just you, it just gives you all these buttons without any context. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the opposite end, I really like, like you mentioned Monster Hunter, it's like, uh, I used to. Same. Mm -hmm. You would have, you would have those persistent on-screen reminders to say, hey, like, this is how you can use your wire bug. As you mentioned, uh, like just cause two or games where like a loading screen is used to just kind of say, here's everything how to play the game. Just, just, just get it up, Re review it, memorize it, take a picture of it, ga gamer, all right, keep going. That's one way to do it, but 
I, I've seen and a lot of sites have talked about a better way to go about that is like in a Soulsborne game, using those as a way to convey, here's some more in-game lore. It's not vital to your gameplay, but it's fun and pads it out. Or the Bayonetta game series are similar, where the loading screen is essentially your sandbox. Practice your moves, learn your combos, have those button commands visible on the side of the screen so you know what the F you just did and the cool kicky shooty gun thing in me that the witch lady just did to, uh, to reconnoiter it. That's that kind of that good balance of using that available space to provide that contextual information and make it relevant to what's going on. Thank you for that. Um, polka dot, uh, paintball mask, brown jacket. So you said you weren't uh, in game design for academia, mm -hmm. cis hetero male, but male in the 30s. Yes. Um, so I'm curious as to what made you so uh, fascinated with the uh, So. I think what really got my interest in inclusive design has kind of been the evolution of I, I got my degree in education entirely through online courses, which is both a blessing and a curse. Um, you can have exceptionally well done online courses that are engaging, that have a rich uh, variety of content. You can have recorded videos, well-timed feedback from your instructor. Uh, all of your assignments add up to a total score and you can change different topics and means of, hey, maybe I don't want to write a paper, but I'll do it like a short film to cover all those topics. And maybe it's just a wall of incomprehensible PowerPoint assignments and Microsoft Word documents that you have to read through each week and then submit a paper that you don't hear anything back on until halfway through the course is done before you can make changes. So that kind of raw experience and learning about the idea of gamification, adding game elements into the education process with the goal of making it more engaging was kind of my what carried me through that. That was what I loved and the idea that I've tried to shoot for in my work. And then COVID hit. And everything went online. And in my department, we heard a lot from students and faculty about how do we keep people interested? We can't all day on Zoom does not work. And it's important to have that cool down time. But like, what, what is the balance of that? How do you find what that is? And so just kind of coming out of that, coming out of the idea of we want online courses to be engaging, but we want them to respect people's time and the challenges that, that they may had. A big thing that we told our faculty at the time is that we have the privilege of having comfortable homes with good internet connection. Some of our students may have to drive to the nearest McDonald's and sit in their parking lot for however long their cell phone battery lasts to spool off of their Wi-Fi just to get their assignments done. So in that regard, having short lecture videos, having you know PDF documents rather than niche app-generated thingamabobs, kind of all of that has been like my rolling stone, combined with I play Nintendo way too much, uh, to kind of intersect these two things and what got me so excited about this topic in the first place. Uh, yes? So just, so just to make sure I understood kind of the idea of for um, user experience and that kind of design, how that can relate to games and how that may go into this and how that may resolve. Yeah, then let me see any like standards being set by like the environment like your game should be this criteria. Mm-hmm. Um so I, I speaking on at least what I do and my colleagues in my work, my my boss, she actually came to education from her own graphic design and like website design. So that's been her primary focus. And she really encourages the idea of while it may be hard to do because games are made by different companies on different consoles at different systems, at least within the environment of a game or within the environment of an experience such as an online class, making sure that whatever layout you use, whatever font styles and sizes you use, whether kind of artistic choices or using icons or realistic images, that once you, yeah, once you have that set pattern, once you kind of have that template, once you have that collection of assets, that you don't really deviate too much from that, or if you do, it's for a good specific choice. It's always a pain when you realize, oh, they moved the, the stop button or the pause button around things or like when the order of something gets mixed up. Like we always try to make sure that the, the summary of a course is at the top and then what you need for the course is at the bottom and then navigation for that course, walk through the site, tools and resources, how to use those things is always in that consistent pattern. So at least when our students go to engage it, they know exactly where to go, no matter who's teaching it, no matter when they're teaching it. So I guess kind of trying to relate that to, if not each individual game, just focusing on that consistency within the game itself is what I would really try to encourage and promote. If that 
hopefully answered or at least confirmed what you're doing. Thank you for that. Uh, just up front in the NASA, and then we'll work back to the right side of the audience. All right, so you mentioned okay, like, like Dark Souls or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Notoriously very difficult game. Mm -hmm. To that extent, with accessibility, do you consider a difficulty slider to be an accessibility option? And moreover, should harder games just like stay hard for the sake of it, or should it be accessible to everybody? That is a really excellent question. Thank you for asking that. What I think the best that I can answer that is to stand on the shoulders of people who have shoulders of more accomplished people with more expertise that have done this for I, because one week ago, Masahiro Sakurai, thank you time, released his own video on YouTube on his channel doing a full walkthrough of the all the accessibility features present in The Last of Us Part 2, specifically highlighting the ones that would directly impact the game's difficulty setting. So the question was, does accessibility change the difficulty of a game, and if so, should that happen? In the case of what Sakurai walked through in that game, any setting that would change the difficulty of the game, such as if you crouch down, you're always invisible to enemies. All of those options were default locked so that while a player could choose to enable them, they would have to make the conscious choice to turn that on and no one recognize, I am choosing to impact the difficulty of this game now. And I think that could be a really eloquent eloquent way of doing that because you can say, hey, Elden Ring, I really like your imperceptive and ob obtuse story. I want to know more. I cannot get past bosses X, Z, and 32. So I'm just going to at least scale it down to easy mode, get past them, get back in the story, and get back in where it's more of a balance that I think is good. So I can only speak as myself, which is a video game appreciator here, and I think having the ability to control, if not the overall difficulty, at least some of the things that impact that difficulty can be a great tool if there is something more to just the raw grind of a game. If a game is just supposed to be hard for the pure hair-pullingly sake of being hard, hashtag desert bus, um, that is certainly a choice. And as long as people can at least know that that's what they should be engaging with, I can see that being a good case. But I think if there's really a story or something that people might want to experience behind the barrier of, I just, I can't hit this quick time event fast enough, being able to change that quick time event to just hold the buttons down for as long as you need can be an eloquent alternative or solution to that. So I'm going to say, watch Masahiro Sakurai's video on his YouTube channel, and that's a better discussion of what I can just regurgitate. Yeah, no, no problems. It was a really good one, so thank you for that. Uh, green sweater. Um, so I was kind of wondering, especially because you work on the Mm -hmm. I'm working on a educational simulator type game for kids. Hats off, first off. And um, I was sort of wondering, how do you do a like tutorial and an inclusive when you have um, like academic concepts in a game, and the kids can't necessarily like just go in and change the academic concept because mm -hmm. it's not going to prove it. Mm -hmm. How do you still make that accessible? Because part of the aim of it is to be inclusive and mm -hmm. just um, like a good experience for everyone. The biggest thing that I would say there, and I know at least in games this can come in a variety of ways, but from education I've really come to appreciate and enjoy the idea of the practice test or the practice exam. Giving people that safe space, that sandbox where they can try something out, where they can test their own knowledge. If, they, if you're introducing a new concept before it's actually tested for impact, either getting a score, just giving, giving them the chance to run things through and see, do you know this? Is there anything new? Can be good. And the same is for if ever you're introducing a new option, idea, control, um, having that space to try and fail without really major repercussions is kind of my, my off-the-cuff answer. That's a really good question for a really good environment. So I, I apologize, I don't know if that's helping it much at all. But um, I would say really just kind of trying to give as many opportunities to try and fail safely before they are graded on it would be kind of what I would go with first. And also, if there is any way to have someone close to that audience's like age range or experience level provide feedback themselves, that could also be really good. So you can kind of hear from them, oh, they just simply 
we as an, an adult or the designer just we may just inborn have the knowledge of how to do this whereas they just they just simply haven't had that life experience yet or they just may need to be taught how to do the thing before they can do the other thing successfully in the extra credits video that i showed earlier there was a snippet where they speak about one of their teammates went to work on a design project and spent about 20 minutes trying to figure out how to open his character's inventory. And the next person said, oh yeah, what you do is you triple click on the body of the character that you're playing. And, and he was like, why would anyone ever think to do that? And the designer was like, oh yeah, we didn't really think about it from the player side. That's a great question. We should change that, I guess. So that kind of change in perspective of feedback can also be a really effective tool. Again, if it's doable within your particular context. Again, ACE is for designing that experience, so that's fantastic. All right, I think we got five minutes left, so we'll do a question from gentleman in the green, and then I will show my information here if anybody wants to you know, connect any further from that. So, close us out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a really great question in terms of games making the choice to not have a tutorial or games making the abject choice to be difficult. And I think that would honestly be another, that would be a good lead into a discussion on, you know, games as an art form rather than kind of game or an experienced art form because I see it as a lot of that in terms of if a game is really trying to deliver a, an experience for someone that is that, that is purposely frustrating or that is perfectly hard or to elicit a strong emotional reaction, if that is the primary goal of the game, I, that, that, that is a really kind of, that is a really, Good question. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for making putting me on the spot. I guess it kind of really kind of comes down to what is the designer's intent towards the audience that they are trying to achieve. If I was doing it, if that was someone's goal, fine. I would just recommend saying up front, this game will not have a tutorial. You have to find it out your own way. Communicating that in whatever way, so at least the person going in isn't expecting something that they would never see. Unless that expectation of something that they would never see is the actual choice that is made by the designer as an artistic statement or, or emotional intent, and then that should be discussed by someone who has different degrees and expertise than I, unfortunately. But um, at least being upfront on what it will and will not tell you without breaking that goal is what I would kind of edge on, so thank you. Uh, final slide. This is my professional LinkedIn information. This is my social information. I rarely post to any of those, but if you want to follow me, I may in the future. So thank you guys. More importantly though, this bit.ly link and the QR code, that links to the PDF copy of these slides and uh, resources, as well as the um, citations, acknowledging the work of other people that I built mine on. It is all listed there. Uh, please, please, please read through it. There's some great resources and they, I am just standing on the shoulders of those who have stood before me. So if this has been interesting, please follow that and you'll get a lot more out of it than I have shown today. Thank you so much, MAGFest. It means a lot to me that you guys came out this late on a Saturday night and uh, happy convention to you all. Colossus Roar. Thank you all.